Toronto, Canada has a meager crime rate as compared to other cities and even countries. That's because the community is ready to step up and help others in need, especially in terrifying times. For instance, in mid-2016, a man was saved from getting attacked by a hammer-wielding assailant by his young neighbor. But just a year later, there wouldn't be anyone who could save a 22-year-old Tess Ritchie, and she would ultimately meet her very tragic end. Tess Ritchie was looking for a way to distract herself from a terrible and recent breakup. So she decided to meet a friend at a bar for a night out. Little did she know that she was about to be driven straight into the hands of death. The case of Tess Ritchie is a prime example of evil being in plain sight and how two events separated by just one year can coincide on one fateful night and cause utter devastation. Tess Ritchie was born on November 30th of 1994 and grew up in North Bay, Ontario, Canada. Tess was the youngest of five daughters and the apple of everyone's eye. Being the youngest, according to her sisters, she was spoiled rotten. But despite being the family princess, she was an extremely down-to-earth, humble, and caring girl. She wasn't afraid to speak her mind and had a very generous, outgoing, and cheerful personality. Tess was an avid animal lover. Her two dogs, Phil and Pearl, were her life. And can we just pause for a second and acknowledge how great of a name Phil is for a dog? I gave my tiny dogs a grown man's name too. And this is Carl, and Hank is in the other room. But anyway, Tess was a loyal and very protective person of the people that she loved. She also had a green thumb, and she loved to plant trees and had a vast collection of houseplants. She also worked as an assistant manager at the local Days Inn in North Bay. And when she turned 19, she moved to the metropolitan city of Toronto with dreams of pursuing a career in service and eventually traveling. Tess wanted to work as an air hostess in an airline. And when she moved to Toronto, she enrolled in the flight services program at Seneca College and graduated by April of 2017. After graduating, Tess applied to multiple airlines and even upscale hotels to get her dream job. She also juggled several part-time jobs, including working in a Toronto coffee bar. Tess, still waiting to hear back from the airline job she applied for, decided to pursue another career on the side, and that was related to languages. Tess learned Italian and was seeking job opportunities as an au pair in Italy, which is basically a live-in nanny situation. Tess, being an ambitious young woman with lots of dreams, also started a YouTube channel, and she primarily talked about her experiences of being in abusive relationships, advocating for women's rights, and she even posted some music cover songs. Tess was a fierce and strong woman who wanted to create a safe space for women in the same boat as her, women who'd survived difficult relationships. Tess wanted to help others and wasn't afraid of sharing her vulnerable experiences with her online community. The last video Tess posted on YouTube was on February 23rd of 2014, and it was about being in a relationship with an abuser. Even from the video, you can tell that Tess was a mature young woman who knew what she deserved. Her way of addressing such an unfortunate and life-altering topic was inspirational for other women. All in all, Tess was a beautiful young woman with so much to look forward to. In November of 2017, everything was about to change for the worse, though. And Tess was about to experience just how vile and sinister some people can be. On November 23rd, 2017, just a week before her 23rd birthday, Tess was going through a rough patch in her life. She'd recently broken up with her boyfriend, Julian, and was feeling understandably down. Knowing that her family, especially her sister, would be there for her, Tess went to visit her older sister, Rachel, in Midtown Toronto on November 24th, which was a Friday. Rachel was Tess's source for comfort and support. Rachel wanted her sister to start feeling better again, but since the breakup was still fresh, Tess was inconsolable. She wasn't eating, and Rachel had to persuade her to eat something, anything. Rachel tried to pacify Tess by talking about the breakup with her, distracting her with shopping, and spending some much-needed quality time together. Rachel also cheered Tess up to some extent by taking her to her favorite place, the dog park. Tess was feeling a lot better, and she was even cracking a smile and laughing, which Rachel was relieved to see. Rachel and Tess spent the majority of the afternoon together because later that evening, Tess had to meet up with an old high school friend named Riley Simrad. Fast forward to about 11.30 p.m. Tess called an Uber to go meet up with Riley. She said goodbye to Rachel, who saw her sister running down the stairs to catch the Uber. 
Little did Rachel know that this would be the last time she would ever see Tess again. Tess had plans to meet up with Riley at a downtown drag bar called Cruise and Tango's, located on Church Street. And when she arrived and was waiting for Riley to show up, Tess texted Rachel at around midnight to let her know that she'd arrived at the bar safely. Now, this was something that the sisters would do a lot. Tess, being the youngest, was always looked after by her older sisters, and they'd made a pact to let each other know where they were, especially if they were going out alone or at odd hours. After receiving Tess's text, Rachel was at ease and just let her enjoy her night out. The following morning, on November 25th, Rachel texted Tess at about 8.45 a.m. to ask about her night out, but she didn't get a response. Now, Rachel wasn't alarmed or scared at this point, as she knew that Tess had a long night and that she probably was sleeping her exhaustion off. But when 6 p.m. approached and Tess still hadn't heard back from Rachel, this began to worry her, and she was prompted to check Tess's movements through a Fitbit account that the sisters shared, and the Uber account that was linked to their mother as well. When Rachel saw Tess's activity on the Fitbit account, she was very concerned and very confused. She found out that Tess had walked about 300 steps at around 3 a.m. Rachel then discovered an Uber ride that was requested at around 4 a.m., but what's so confusing is that this was canceled by the driver, suggesting that Tess likely never made it home. All of this information terrified Rachel to no end, and 22-year-old Rachel was reported missing on that same day. Now, Canada is a relatively safe country, and its crime rate is way less than that of the US. So it was alarming for the Toronto police to see that a young woman had gone missing with such bizarre clues left behind. An official investigation was launched, and the investigators knew that time was ticking away. If Tess was out there in danger, then the police had to find her quickly and return her safely to her family. But that wouldn't happen. There were very limited leads in the case, and as hours turned into days, the Toronto community felt even more anxious and scared for Tess. Tess's family, including her mother and sisters, also joined the search. On November 27th, almost two days after Tess was reported missing, her family made the four-hour drive from North Bay to Toronto, with flyers in their hands to join the search for Tess. They were holding on to the sliver of hope that Tess would be found alive and safe. And meanwhile, detectives also searched the Church Street and Wellesley area, but there was no sign of Tess. After four long days of searching for Tess, which was the equivalent to an eternity for the Ritchie family, Tess's mother, Christine, and her friend discovered something horrible. It's something that a mother should never have to witness. On November 29th, just a day before Tess's birthday, Christine and her longtime friend, Anna Brazo, a nurse at St. Michael's Hospital, decided to look around the Church Street in Wellesley area again, as this was the obvious place where Tess was last seen. They reached a house that was closed for renovation, with a narrow stairwell that went to a basement door, about two doors down from where Tess was last known to have been. While walking past the building, which was actively under construction, something caught Anne's eye, and she stopped to look at the end of the staircase. She immediately noticed a woman's lifeless body at the end of the stairs, and she called out for Christine. When Christine approached the stairs and took one look at the scene, it was as if her world had completely stopped. Christine had discovered her missing daughter, Tess, was no longer alive. Generally, in true crime cases, it's the police or a random passerby who discovers the body of a missing person, and then the family is informed of their beloved's passing. But this scene was truly tragic, and it's hard to imagine the thoughts that must have been going through Christine's mind when she discovered Tess, for whom they were praying and hoping to be alive and well. This scene completely crushed Christine and the Ritchie family. And stumbling across something like this, that image never leaves your mind, never. That's the type of image that 20 years from now, you're out having a great night with friends and family, then all of a sudden, the image pops back up in your mind out of nowhere. These are scars that truly will never heal. And it's beyond devastating that Tess's own family had to witness this. What was even more infuriating was that this place was searched by investigators just a couple of days prior, meaning there are two possibilities here. Either the police 100% didn't search the area like they claimed they did, or someone had placed Tess's body there after the search had been completed. Regardless of which scenario is closer to reality, Tess's body had to be taken in for an autopsy, and initially, the police ruled Tess's death as an accident, as there were no visible signs of trauma or struggle on Tess's body. 
But on December 1st, 2017, the autopsy revealed something entirely different. Tessa's cause of death was neck compression, which is in line with strangulation. So it couldn't have been an accident. Moreover, male DNA was found on Tessa's clothes. This was the point where the case took a turn and was investigated in light of a possible homicide. But the detectives and the city of Toronto still had many questions. Like, who would try to do something so heinous to Tess? Was it someone close to her? And what happened on the night that she went to the cruise in Tango's bar? Well, the answers to these questions would soon be revealed. The police, having no possible suspects, turned to the CCTV footage of that fateful night and tried to piece together a timeline of events. Luckily, the CCTV footage in the neighboring areas, as well as the bar where Tess went, provided a breakthrough in the case. See, the surveillance footage showed that Tess was walking hand in hand with an unidentified man shortly before her tragic demise. The investigators also decided to question Tess's friend, Riley, who was with her on the night of the attack. Riley said that she and Tess had a lot to drink, so much so that the bar security asked them to leave. CCTV footage showed Tess and Riley leaving the club at around 2 a.m. The girls then walked to a hot dog cart on Wellesley Street, where they interacted with several people, including a woman outside of her house and a man who proceeded to accompany the girls from that point onwards. The woman named Michelle was later interviewed. She said that she talked to Tess and Riley while smoking a cigarette outside of her home. Tess confided in Michelle about her recent breakup, and Michelle comforted her for a short while. Turns out, Michelle really liked Tess from the get-go, and had even given her number to Tess if she ever needed to just talk to someone. After this encounter, which lasted about 20 minutes, Riley received a text from her boyfriend at around 4 a.m., asking her to come home, at which point Tess decided to call it a night and call an Uber back to the house further corroborating the activity Rachel found on the app. So it was Tess who requested the Uber, but she never got in it. And this begs the question, what happened to Tess during this time? Well, this is where the surveillance footage showed more of what happened that night. Riley's story was confirmed because at around 4.02 a.m., she was seen walking away from Tess, heading towards her own home. But Tess wasn't alone. Remember the guy that accompanied the girls near the hot dog cart? Well, he was with Tess when Riley left for home. This man and Tess proceeded to walk to 582 Church Street and down the staircase where Tess would later be discovered on November 29th. The staircase was out of the surveillance camera's frame, but 45 minutes later, the man was seen again, walking in the opposite direction, very close to the fence in a slow strut. He was alone, and Tess was nowhere to be found. This revelation shocked the police, who knew that this man had something to do with the attack on Tess. But there was one big problem. Detectives didn't know who this man was. But it wouldn't be for too long, as the man in question would soon come to the police. See, after the grainy footage of the man with Tess was released to the public, the police received a phone call from a man who claimed to be the guy in the footage. But who was he? And why was he with Tess on the night of her attack? And did he harm Tess? Kalen Schlatter was a 21-year-old man living with his parents and younger brother in North Toronto. Friends, neighbors, and family described Kalen as a sweet and caring young man. He didn't have a criminal record, and in fact, he was considered a town hero. A year prior to Tessa's tragic passing, Kalen had saved his neighbor from being attacked by an assailant with a hammer. He'd heard a scuffle between a man wielding a hammer and his neighbor, and when Kalen intervened, the attacker took off running. The local TV station even interviewed the man about his helpful efforts to keep the community safe from crime. After the phone call, the police called in Kalen for an interview, which he went to with his parents and his lawyer. But Kalen's behavior took a complete 180, as he was uncooperative and even refused to give his DNA. Well, it turns out that the police didn't have to struggle for it, because Kalen's own parents would unknowingly help them out. See, Kaylin's parents had brought their son some water and snacks, and Kaylin even took a couple of swigs from the water bottle before discarding it. The police retrieved the water bottle and sent the DNA off of it for testing. About as simple as it gets. A couple of days later, they hit a jackpot. Kaylin's DNA matched the DNA found on Tess's body, putting Kaylin at the scene of the crime and holding him accountable for whatever happened to Tess. Kaylin was immediately arrested and held in a cell. And this is where things get very confusing for everyone. Kalen was considered to be a gentleman in the community. So why was his DNA found on Tess's body? 
Well, looks can be deceiving, and something very dark lurked beneath Kaylin's happy and chirpy facade, which would soon be uncovered. Kaylin's cell was located beside that of two other criminals, who were actually undercover cops. They were disguised in hopes of getting a confession out of Kaylin. And well, Kaylin wasted no time in revealing a lot of disturbing details about himself. Kaylin boasted about his charm and claimed to be a ladies' man who knew, quote, how to seduce women. He also went on to brag about being with over 40 women despite his relatively young age, which was extremely alarming if it's true. Kaylin's phone was also confiscated, and it revealed a lot of dark things. It turns out that Kaylin was interested in some incredibly violent sexual acts and watched loads of, well, explicit videos. This revelation was further solidified when Kaylin's ex-girlfriends were questioned. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of what they revealed to the police, but they confirmed that he had some very unique interests, some of which were violent. If that wasn't eerie enough, a closer look at the bar's CCTV footage showed Kaylin present at the bar at the time Tess and Riley were asked to leave, meaning that he may not have met the girls at the hot dog stand, as detectives originally believed. He may have been stalking them. The footage showed Tess and Kaylin a mere shoulder's width away from each other, which is so creepy to think about in hindsight. Even though Tess and Kaylin didn't interact inside the bar or even know each other beforehand, one thing was clear. Kaylin had his sights on Tess at that point. Kaylin also confessed to the undercover cop that Tess was alive when he left her at the staircase, but he soon changed his story and said that he was inebriated and didn't remember what had happened that night. With all of this information, on March 21st, 2018, the investigators upgraded the charges on Kaylin from second degree to first degree. Finally, almost two years after Kaylin was arrested, his trial was scheduled for January 12th of 2020. Kaylin's attorneys argued that Tess's attacker was someone else, even naming this person in court, and they stressed that Kaylin had nothing to do with Tess's passing. But the prosecution was two steps ahead of the defense. They'd already questioned the suspect in question, and he was cleared of any suspicion. Kaylin also took the stand in court and explained the reason why his DNA was on Tess's body. Kaylin claimed that he and Tess bonded over their mutual breakups after meeting on the street outside the bar, and Tess was highly engrossed in the conversation, so much so that she even ignored a phone call during that time. But the prosecution slammed this story shut very quickly because Tess's phone records showed no incoming calls on the night of her tragic attack and passing. So Kaylin was essentially lying, but he wasn't done. Kaylin proceeded to claim that Tess had initiated the flirtatious advances and the two had kissed for a bit before Kaylin, well, got excited. And he claims that this is how his DNA got onto Tess's body. But there was no evidence to support this claim. During his confession, Kaylin claimed that he invited Tess to his house, but she refused, saying that they couldn't go any further, and asked Kaylin to leave, which he did. He repeated the fact that Tess was alive by the time he left, but the prosecution didn't believe Kaylin's web of lies because if Tess were alive at that time, then she should have gotten into the Uber, which was canceled by the driver because Tess failed to show up. It was suspected that Kaylin had somehow convinced Tess to go into the dark alley and that he then tried to make advances on her. When Tess refused, this hurt Kaylin's ego, and he proceeded to then subdue Tess, take advantage of her, and ended up strangling Tess with either a soft cloth or his cloth-covered forearm, which could explain why there weren't any ligature marks on Tess's neck. The prosecution also showed the jury the amount of surveillance footage, along with the statements of Kaylin's ex-girlfriends. The prosecution also called another witness, a fellow cellmate of Kaylin's, from a Toronto correctional facility where both men were held in 2018. The cellmate, known publicly as E.S., testified in court that he initially felt sorry for Kaylin as he was a young man in jail for the first time. But as time passed, E.S. started noticing very bizarre things about Kaylin. Kaylin would cry himself to sleep, but not due to the guilt of robbing a young woman of her life. Rather, it was because he didn't want to serve a long sentence for killing Tess, and that he missed his mother. What was even more maddening was the fact that during a tearful testimony delivered by Tess's sister, Rachel, who expressed feelings on seeing Tess for the final time, Kaylin was listening to everything with a calm and stoic expression, and his face was devoid of any emotion. Kaylin was terrified to tears of having to face consequences for what he did to an innocent woman but he didn't even flinch when Tess's sister was breaking down in court, reminiscing on the final moments with her sister. 
The cellmate also went on to testify that Kalen confessed that he lost control when Test refused to go, quote, all the way with him. And in a fit of rage, Kalen strangled Tess with a scarf. On the other hand, Kalen denied having any conversation with this ES person and repeatedly tried to claim his innocence, which is beyond infuriating. In the end, Kalen's trial lasted about six weeks, and after deliberation, the jury came forth with their verdict. On March 23rd, 2020, Kalen was found guilty. The trial of Tess's murder was emotionally jarring for the Ritchie family. In the end, Kalen was sentenced to 25 years behind bars, a slap on the wrist compared to what happened to Tess. Christine had not only lost her daughter on that fateful night of November 25th, but her family had been scarred forever. Tess was the light of their lives, and Rachel, being the last person to spend time with Tess, couldn't even anticipate that she would never see that beaming smile of her sister again. It's just so heartbreaking to see what the Ritchie family went through. The Toronto police also made a huge mistake of not searching for Tess's body more carefully. Tess's body was found in an area where the police had already looked, but they failed to locate her, and her body had to be found by her own mother, Christine, who's now traumatized for life. She explained the scene as similar to looking into a grave. Now, I'd previously mentioned that it was possible that Tess's body wasn't missed by the police, but that it may have been moved there after the fact. But the courts were able to conclude that this simply wasn't the case. Tess had been there the whole time, and investigators just didn't look closely enough. Due to the negligence of police during the search for Tess, two officers, Alan McCullough and Michael Jones, were charged with two counts of misconduct and neglect of duty in June of 2018. The police officers failed to comb the area and didn't even bother to interview the neighbors or notify a supervisor on what was going on. Shockingly, the two police officers are still part of the police force, although they did receive penalties for their neglect in the search for Tess. The Toronto police have failed to provide more information regarding this action, which is all the more frustrating for the Ritchie family. Christine, while reliving the terrible memory of finding her daughter's lifeless body, accused the police of misconduct by stating, quote, if they'd followed protocol, they would have found her. She was lying just around the corner. The Ritchie family is still reeling from this painful loss. Tess was the baby of the family, and although she was everyone's favorite, she was someone who would help anyone and not hurt a single soul. According to Christine, Tess was made of everything good in the world, and why Kaylin, a stranger, would even attack a loving and caring person like Tess remains a mystery to this day. It seems like Kaylin was yet another example of a person who couldn't take no for an answer and desperately wanted what he couldn't have. The Ritchie family went through a lot with Tess's passing, as a result of which they filed a $20 million lawsuit against Kaylin, the Toronto Police Department, and Cruz and Tangos. The sheer brutality Kaylin displayed and the neglect of investigators and detectives are the two main reasons, according to the Ritchie family, that Tess isn't around anymore. Their incredibly expensive lawsuit is a way of showing Tess respect, honoring her after her unfortunate passing, and a means for the family to heal from this tragic loss. As of right now, there haven't been any updates on whether the Ritchie family has been successful in suing the parties involved or not, but I sure hope they will be. The case of Tess Ritchie is all sorts of alarming, devious, and heartbreaking. To think that Tess, who was just out for a good time with a friend, had her life taken from her in such a tragic and brutal way is beyond upsetting, and that too by someone who is a stranger to her. To think that this tragic case took place in one of the safest cities in Canada is just baffling. We can only hope that the Toronto police have learned their lesson and take missing person cases more seriously because of how Tess's case was handled it was beyond unprofessional. While Kaylin is certainly to blame for such a tragic loss, the police could have at least spared the Ritchie family the heartache of having to find their daughter themselves. But sadly, that just isn't what happened. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a few channel members, including Stephanie Kastrup and Jamie Vest. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you'll gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way to help keep the channel afloat and help out. 
I'm so grateful to those of you who have decided to do that. And if you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link in the description or down in the comments. I'm working on some new ideas to make the channel membership even better for you guys, and we're thinking about possibly mailing out some pieces of true crime merchandise as a thank you. But if you guys have any ideas of what else you'd like to see from the membership program, just let me know down in the comments and I'll see what we can make happen. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.